Um, my challenge is, is there's so many threads I want to pull on there. Um, but I want to, I, I want to, you know, go towards the, the very sort of, at least initially supply side uh, viewpoint of, of the book you just came out with. Um, I want to put it a pin in a couple of things there. Um, real quick, I just want to ask one question based on what you said, because I really love your, your feedback on it. Um, when you were talking about the U.S., you talked about the low labor force particip participation rate that we have here. And um, I think you said it was like around 62 percent. And I'm just curious, like what 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 really is driving that? Um, we, we, we seem to have a huge chunk of our working age population that is not working. And you probably study this more than most people. Like, what's what's truly going on there? Um, do we have a uh, is is it just an aging population that truly can't work? Um, I know that disability has been a has seen massive growth over the past like fifteen years. Um, you know, are there a bunch of people that are opting out or gaming the system or whatever? But what's responsible for us only having sixty two percent of our working age population actually engaged in working? Well. There are two answers to that, and but they're consistent. I'll give you both. The short answer is it doesn't matter. And now you, you you listed a number of factors. I'll go back over those factors, and you're, you're right. But it doesn't matter. It, it low is low. In other words, the the thing about labor force participation is a very simple calculation. You you say how many people are working. That's the the, the numerator, and how big is the labor force? That's the denominator. That's all it is. Now it's never a hundred percent, right? Because there are students and homemakers and retirees and others, there are good reasons for some people not to be in the workforce at any given time. But as recently as 2000, that number was 70%. What drove it between 19, about approximately 1975 and 2000 was basically women entering the workforce, women who had been home um, you know, as homemakers or uh, you know, performing other roles entered the workforce and then that number went up. So it, like I guess it's never a hundred, but 70 was very strong. 62 is, is down a lot. I mean, that's, um, about a 14% decline. Um, look, you know, GDP, the standard definition is, um, you know, it's consumption plus investment plus net exports plus, you know, government expenditure, like a four part thing. Yeah, but there's a simpler way to do it, which is how many people are working, how productive are they? Just who's working and how productive are they? That, that equals nominal GDP. Um, and if you have fewer people working, there's the, the economy is going to shrink unless productivity is going up, which it's not. Uh, and so this is one of the major headwinds. Now, you're right. There are some early retirees. Um, there were a lot of people who stayed home, obviously, during COVID. And just it, it's very well studied and clear that um, working is a habit, you know, it's a good habit, I think, for the most part. But it's like any habit. Once you break it, it's hard to go back. So once you get used to not working, or working from home or, you know, we're just staying home. Um, the government was handing out checks, you know, beginning with Trump in, uh, I believe it was June 2020. Everybody got a, uh, that one was a $1,400 check. And then in December 2020, at the end of the Trump administration, everybody got a $600 check. And Biden comes in in February 2021, not to be outdone. He hands out, uh, I think, a $1,600 check. Um, so everybody got a check, like two or three of them. And uh, a lot of younger people uh, opened accounts on Robinhood and started trading Bitcoin. That didn't work out too well. But um, but a lot of people saved the money. But but there was a very there were de very definite spikes in retail sales coming within 30 days of the checks. Well, that's not surprising. I give people free money; they'll go buy stuff. And that kind of kept the economy going. It wasn't a real boom, but it yeah it 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 um, it looked good. But we're not doing that anymore. There's no more checks. Uh, and so you had a lot of people lost the habit, a lot of people staying home, watching, you know, maybe uh, the World Series or whatever, eating Doritos, but they're not working. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, a lot of people out of the habit, but they just got used to government handouts. Not everybody, but but some. And um, the other problem is, uh, you know, because people say, wait a second, how can you have low labor force participation? When everywhere you look, they're help on the signs, which there are. I mean, I was, right. you know, McDonald's is paying a thirty-five thousand dollar for an entry level like cashier or hamburger, um, you know, maker uh, with benefits, training, and advancement. Well, that's pretty good for you know, a entry level hamburger person. Um, 
so there are la- the, and people call this a labor shortage. There isn't actually a labor shortage because we just talked about how you've got perhaps as many as 10 million, you know, people between the ages of 25, 54 who are sitting home. But the problem from the employer's point of view, there's a shortage of willing workers. Not, willing workers, yeah. Not workers, but willing workers. Well, what makes you willing to work? Well, a, a raise, <laughs> a good pay is, is one. And those employers can't afford to pay the clearing wage to get people off the couch because they'll go bankrupt themselves. They're working on very small margins. You know, sales are declining, et cetera. So I'll pay as much as I can to get the workers, but it's not enough to get this person off the couch, so to speak. And so you've got this really weird situation. I use weird in the, in the technical sense where you have a huge pool of able-bodied, you know, potential workers, but a shortage of willing workers because you can't pay a clearing wage. But that's more a reflection of uh, how stressed business is and how low margins are. And then you look at the big names. I mean, um, I guess Twitter is the most recent, but, uh, you know, Amazon, FedEx, um, you know, Target, uh, they're all looking at, at big layoffs and they're, big, layoffs, they're big, yeah. big layoff announcements coming every day. So um, not, none of which is good for, uh, for the U.S. economy. But, um, I, you know, the Fed looks at unemployment. I mean, I look at it because you're supposed to know what it is. I mean, uh, I would say if you're, if you're trying to forecast the Fed, you got to look at the world the way they do, even if it's messed up. Like even if they're looking at the wrong things, which they are, as an analyst, you have to look at them to figure out what they're doing. That's that's how you do intelligence work. Think like the other guy. But then once I take my Fed hat off and say, well, what do I think? Um, the, the unemployment rate is almost irrelevant. First, that's a lagging indicator. Secondly, it ignores what we talked about with labor force participation. There is no Phillips curve. I mean, you can draw one. Last time I saw a Phillips curve was flat. Or well, I went to school, curves weren't flat. But that's uh, but they're, they're just looking at the wrong indicators. Okay. All right. Well, th- th- thanks for going through that with me because I, I do worry that um, you know there's there's something not good um, a- a- about such a low participate uh, labor force participation rate um, from a from an economic standpoint, right? Like we're not being as productive as we could be as a society, and there's something not good societally about it where you get a smaller and smaller group that is doing all the caring, all the water caring for society, and you begin to get you know animosity growing there. Um, so anyways, I'm curious, do you, do you, we're in this weird time, do you think, is basically a painful recession going to be what sort of cures it, which is it evaporates the excess job openings, the people on the couch finally just run out of, of means as long as there's still no government checks going to them, and eventually they have to say, hey, if I want to afford Doritos, I got to go get a job. I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, because... Uh... Uh, I don't know if the, what the recession is the cure for. It's coming. I mean, the yeah, recession is coming, but who, um, and, and Jay Powell said this. I mean, Jay Powell gave two speeches, August 26th at uh, Jackson Hole and September 21st after a press conference after the FOMC meeting that day. Uh, and the September 21st speech was almost like, well, just in case you weren't listening to me in Jackson Hole, let me tell you again what's happening. And he was in Jackson Hole. He was like, Nancy Pelosi, he tore up a speech and wrote a new one, like literally the day before. Yep. It was three or four pages. It was really short. Uh, he used the word pain three times in one paragraph. I've been following Fed news for 45 years. I've never seen the word pain ever. Right. That he was uses pretty it three amazing. Times. But he said, but he basically said the same thing. But September 21st, he was even more blunt. He said, there's going to be a recession. It's going to be bad. Uh, unemployment is going to go up. Get it, you know, get it straight. These things are going to happen. And that's what it's going to take to get inflation under control. But he went on and on about how inflation was job one uh, because the Fed has this dual mandate, which never made sense, but it's the law. I mean, Humphrey Hawkins. So um, the dual mandate is price stability and low unemployment. Okay. Those two things don't always go together. And sometimes you got to make trade-offs between the two. But right now, the trade-off is very easy, which is unemployment's really low. Now, I don't put much weight on it, but the Fed does. Again, put your Fed hat on. Unemployment's really low. If unemployment went from 3 point, I think it's a 3.5, 3.6 at the moment. Um, if it went to 4.5, uh, 4.9, is that the end of the world? Well, that was considered pretty low in 2000 you know, 13, when they were doing Q, QE4 or whatever, QE3. Right. So um, so they're willing to do that. Um, and they also think the recession, if it comes, will be 
mild, uh, and uh, but those two things together <laughs> will get inflation under control. <clears throat> and right. and, he and did, by the way, they, they they think the mild because they think they're going to engineer a soft landing, which I'm guessing you think the probability of a soft landing is pretty low, close to zero. 